And according to natural laws, everything that is made is going to break. And uh, every person will eventually get old. Sometimes not eventually. Sometimes they just arrive and maybe a little bit more feeble than what they used to be. And uh, every, every person will eventually get old and every business will collapse if it's not attended to. Houses have to be painted on occasion uh, and, 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 and cars have to be tuned up and fields have to re be replanted every year. And Job understood this and he said, man is born to trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. There are a lot of things that come into our life on a regular basis, and for us to be able to deal with those things, we need to have a formula that God has given us to be overcomers. Amen. And uh, there are some things that are bigger than others, and I think all of us have gone through things that absolutely taxed uh, the very, just who we are. We never anticipated that we would go through such things. I, I'm thinking of the, uh, of the fact that this year, uh, I think the count is now... 16, 17 funerals I've had since the beginning of the year, maybe 18. Uh, in the last month or so, it was 12 already of, of funerals. Um, the world that we live in is uh, full of uh, danger. It is full of things that can come against us. And we need to prepare on how to get ready to get through some of those things. And I, I think sometimes we are surprised when problems come our way, yes? Yeah. Sometimes we're just kind of surprised about, you know, uh, you don't anticipate it and a problem comes. And, and uh, uh, you know, the thing is, it could come at any moment, any time. You just don't know. Did you ever start something and you'd be right in the middle of it and somebody comes and interrupts you? Right? The world, uh, our lives are filled with interruptions. Matter of fact, I think that's what I'm preaching tomorrow night is holy interruptions. And uh, some of them are good and some, some not so good. Some of them hurt uh, all the way down to the quick. And, uh, uh, and, and we say things like, why me? You know, why me? Why am I going through this? Or why now? This is not the best time when you have problems. Right now is not the best time to have them. And uh, why this particular problem? And you need to understand that we don't live in a perfect world, right? Uh, and, and we could expect a perfect world, but the world is not perfect. And so, and the, and the thing is, even though I know all of this, I'm still surprised when problems come. They catch you unaware, don't they? They certainly do. And, uh, and reading the scriptures, we should know already, after you read the scriptures, God himself, Jesus said, this world, in this world, you shall have tribulation. Right. You would think of him alerting us, we'd be ready for it, right? But it seems like every time one of them rascals shows its head, they surprise us. And if you're like me, we, uh, well, we, we start thinking, well... I must be unusual. <laughs> Most people, when they talk about traveling, they say, I just hope I don't have a baker trip. <laughs> you know, because we have a, a history. And, uh, you know, even my daughter-in-law, some, when something goes wrong on the farm, which is about every other day, because I don't know that I'm th the highest quality farmer that we've ever had, she will say, well, it's just another baker thing. <laughs> have you heard that, Jill, before? Tammy, Mariah, Danny, Beth, yeah, the Baker thing. We are unusual. And I think sometimes when problems come our way, that's what we think too. We are unusual. Do I have an unusual slide up there anywhere? You know, I, I might. What's the next one say? Just for kicks and giggles so I'll know what it is. The Ezra Fast and one more. Okay, the purpose of the Ezra Fast is to undo heavy burdens, to solve problems, and inviting the Holy Spirit into our life. That's the purpose. And uh, it's a great... And you know, the thing is, sometimes when things like this do happen to us, these surprising things that come against us, we think, this is, I'm an unusual person, and, and, and I'm unspiritual. Maybe if I lived closer to God, I wouldn't have all these problems. God has forsaken me for some reason. We look at those things. i got to tell you, when it comes to Andy Freeman, I think, and I've said it to him many times, that he must live closer to God than I do. 
because that boy could fall into the proverbial outhouse and come out smelling like a rose. I don't understand it. For me, it doesn't work that way because I'm unusual and unspiritual and God has forsaken me. These are things that we say sometimes. We don't really mean them, but we say them anyway. And, uh, and, and sometimes we, we, we get aggravated because problems come. But most of the time, a lot of the problems come because of something that we've done, yes? And uh, so we are all human. And uh, sometimes we can't think of everything to make it exactly right. Like, for instance, tonight I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had the right PowerPoint presentation. And I knew also that I had the handouts to give to all of you. So take notes because you didn't get a handout one. But I was busy. Okay, get over it. Uh, the book of Ezra tells the story of the Jews and their traveling back from captivity in Persia. And King Cyrus of Persia gave them permission to return in 538 B.C. and to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And first, Zerubbabel led the people back to begin work on the temple. And the surrounding nations began to cause trouble for them. So the work went slowly, even stopping for several years along the way. And the temple was finally finished. And Ezra, a priest, attempted to lead a second group of people back to Jerusalem. He gathered them on the banks of the Ahava River. And then he realized that he had a major problem. And the major problem he had was he was, on the, he was on the spot. Because he had told the king, he said, we can handle this. Have you ever made a spiritual boast? Yeah. You've got to be careful. I've heard people say things like, you know, God told me to say this. Now, let me tell you something. If God has told you to say something, it better be 100% accurate. Because God doesn't make mistakes. He does not. Yeah. But now Ezra is in a spot because he told the king, he said, I don't really need any help. I can take all this money and all these people right through a thief-infested uh, countryside. I don't need any help. That was kind of foolish, don't you think? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you don't ask for help very much? That's a good reason to fast and talk to God because we all need help. And, 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 but he was in a spot here. And so, it, and, and it's kind of like he was saying, not only were there all these Jews returning home, but they were bringing all their household good, goods and treasures. And, uh, and, and I got to tell you, even though that they were in a foreign country, uh, they weren't really considered prisoners. They went to work. They made a fortune. Some of them were very, very rich during that time and they, they wanted to build a temple and they gave abundantly uh, for the temple. And, uh, and they were going with a great deal of uh, goods back to Jerusalem. And uh, so he had, made him, he had said, King, I, I don't need any help. My God will protect us. Okay? Now, that sounds wonderful, but now... He's on a spot because he's looking at what's out there. And he says, uh-oh, this ain't good. Uh, I'm going to need a little help here. And I can't get it from the king because he's embarrassed. He's totally embarrassed. He's on the spot. Man, I'm embarrassed. I've made this statement that God's going to fix everything. And I've got to tell you, at this point now, everybody is looking to see if that's true. And when you, in your spiritual walk, make boasts in the spirit, may I suggest that you do everything that you can to make sure that you're talking to God before you make such a boast. Matter of fact, that's why it's good for us to stop and fast and seek the Lord before we make such a boast. But if we're in a situation where we're really going to need Him to solve problems and we really need the presence of God, that's a good time to call everybody into fast. Go on to the next slide if you would. And so we fasted, he said, and we sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. He said, in other words, God listened to us because we were fasting and we were praying. Sometimes some of the strongholds in our lives, some of the things that we need to break through, are not going to happen unless we seek the Lord in a fast. Amen. Now, there's several kinds of fasts. I, 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 there's like one I have for the church. Looking forward to the future, there's something that I want the church to do and, and be able to accomplish. I'll tell you some of it because it's important. I don't think the church should be in debt. And, uh, and, and we've been very, you know, we have right now, I didn't bring my papers in here, but we have approximately $74,000 that are out still yet in 
pledges. Some people made those pledges and left without paying them. And I, I don't have no fuss to give anybody. They certainly can if they're not a member here. But they didn't make the pledge to Christ the King. They made it to God. So they still owe that money. It may not have been a, a good, good thing for them to do. Because the Bible said it's not good to make a vow and break it. You shouldn't do it. But we have about 70000 Now, anticipating that probably not all $70,000 is coming out, then we go back to the fact that we have about $50,000 out in pledges of people that are here. Okay? That's a lot of money. But here's the thing. If those pledges come in by the end of the year, okay, that means this is what? May, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, in, in seven months. Um, if that money should come in, that's a that's this it's very fortuitous for us. Because because of the big payment that we made last year on the mortgage, we are also paying over three thousand dollars a month now on principal instead of interest the before. And we have a four thousand dollar payment, so at least three thousand plus is going out every single month towards the uh, the overall and as most of you know, at the end of the year, we made a big enough payment, not only from the pledges, but also from the church's coffers to bring it below $200,000. Right now, we're at 180-some. So if you was to take that 7 times 3, that 21000 off of that, you're down to 160-some. And if you take that other $50,000 that is out there, uh, waiting to come in. It's not here yet. It's still in your wallet. But I'm just saying, you're, you're, you know, it's out there. And you bring that in, and now all of a sudden, we're at... What, how much? 110. We have about $120,000 in our coffers. Uh, by the end of this year, it'll probably be closer to 150. That means that we could pay off the church... And still have forty thousand dollars left uh, if everything stays the way it is. But I got to tell you, that's a lot of if. That's a lot of if, because I don't know, you know, what the economy is going to be. I don't know any of that. But that's another reason I would like love for us to be out there. And that's why that for a corporate fast, I would say to you, I want you to consider what you can do to make sure that all of these things are met. Let's come together. There was one church that did this, and they began to fast and pray because of the fact that they were in a financial strait. They began to fast and pray about God giving them something that was so big that they you, know, you had to do that by prayer. It had to have a supernatural part of it. And they were in financial straits, and so they all, the church, and he said, how many would join up? And by the way, you really need to know and enlist who's going to be in your fast. There's, there's several fasts. This is a corporate fast, and so that's a, something you would call for the whole church. But there may be something that you need in your own life to break a stronghold. And you don't want everybody to know about that. So you find somebody that you can trust, and by the way, we don't have too many of those. In our lifetime, we have a lot of environmental acquaintances, but sometimes we don't have a lot of friends. Some people get some information and they think, hey, you know, I know something you don't know and I need to tell you about it. That's not the best friend in the world to cultivate. I ain't kidding. That's an environmental acquaintance. You should not have to tell me that something's confidential. If you talk to me, usually... Unless you've given me permission to say something about it or want me to. I don't even mention it to my wife. Because uh, what, would, what would be the point of that? Me going to her and say, hey, I know something you don't know. Happy days. And then later on, I get in trouble anyway because she said, you knew that and you didn't tell me. <laughs> because most of the time, by the time she finds out, somebody has already squealed, one of the other friends. <laughs> so if you have a personal thing, it's good to know who you're inviting to your fast. Because you need somebody that can come alongside you and validate you and help you along with that fast. And that's something that is, maybe there's some stronghold that you have. And I think uh, Bob mentioned some of them uh, last week. He talked about a person that was uh, uh, addicted to pornography and, and how he needed help to break through that. Others may be having problems with their 
their marriage or and you you may not want all of that information out so you find somebody that can come alongside of you and join you in the fast a corporate fast the one I'm talking about and what they did in this church is they decided and they were going to do something, so he said, next Sunday, we're going to go on this fast, and what's going to happen is, from Sunday to Monday, nobody's going to eat anything. And I want to know, at the end of the day, he said, I want to know how many of you church members are going to join me in that fast. So he's enlisting the people. And uh, the whole church stood up. The whole church, not one person, stayed in their seat. And so the whole church went to fast the next day. And here's the thing. Before long, they had raised over a million dollars because the people had a mind to work. And they got that mind through fasting and prayer and saying, Lord, we need to break this bondage. And by the way, our church, as long as we owe somebody else, we have that bondage on us. And I have been trying desperately, and you have too, and I appreciate you. I thank the Lord for you. But two years ago, I asked you to go with me in a three-year pledge campaign. And everybody told me, they said, you know, we've calculated it out. You cannot pay the church off in three years with what you've asked for. But if that money comes in, those pledges that you gave, and our tithing does not fall in down... We will have paid that church off over $400,000 at the beginning and we'll have paid it off in three years. Now, I cannot tell you where the other $175,000 came from because it's not on the ticket that God sent it anyway. You can't outgive him. And so we began this thing, but what would happen per adventure if we slowed down now. So now's a good time for us to think about, Lord, I would really love to see this happen. So that's one of the things that I want to see happen. It's a big thing. Yeah, it's a big thing. And in those situations, I have asked in the past for the whole church to fast and pray about that stuff. I don't know how many I did or did, but I know I learned a few things since then. From now on, I'll enlist those that I want to see fast. I'll do the same thing he did. How many of you would join me in a fast? Would you stand to your feet? And they all stood up, and what a wonderful thing that was. But it may be that you need to find out who's going to fast with you, and that needs to be, if it's something that's personal, then keep it personal and uh, find somebody that you can trust. Faced with this significant problem that he had, he called a fast, and so we fasted and we entreated our God. Ezra's problem was also their problem. It wasn't just his. It was their problem too. That's what a corporate fest is about. When we see things that affect us all, we try to eliminate those things, get them out. Because I don't know what the future is going to hold for us, but I think it would be wonderful since God has given this place that if our people didn't have a place to, to stay, if peradventure that our next step is a step into tribulation. And I believe with all of my heart that the age of sorrow is already here and come, gone, it is there. The next thing to happen to us is tribulation. But wouldn't it be wonderful if this church was in a situation where we didn't have to worry about losing it and we could put our people over in the gymnasium and cots or whatever and use the land for, to grow groceries. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. But I don't think it's a good thing for us to be in bondage at all. So sometimes we need to understand that we need to share the problem with everybody. If people know about the problem in the corporate situation, then they can work on it. And we have. My goodness, we have come so far. And we're getting close to the end now. And there's every possibility that we can make that strange thing. And by the way, that came about through prayer and fasting. It did. So they... The, you need to be involved in the problem. So it, whether it's a corporate fast or whether it's something that you want personally. You know, I was thinking about it. There's all kinds of fasts. We talked about the Daniel fast. And uh, most people have asked, everybody that's talked to me so far about the fast that says, what am I supposed to eat? And I don't really think that's the issue. I don't think it's, I think it's about prayer. By the way, I do have a recipe up here for biblical pulse. Sounds delicious. And uh, I don't know. Did you all know what pulse is? 
It's like a porridge of vegetables. But listen to this beauty. Now some of you may have some problems with it, but it starts off with a bag of dried beans, like pintos, black navy beans, 12 ounces of lentils, or split peas, you can use either one. A uh, cup of barley, uh, quinoa, mustard powder, mustard, timeric, garlic, coriander, bay leaves, cumin, water, sea salt, bone broth. And you mix it all together and you have this delicious, marvelously sustaining food that once you eat it one time, you say, I can bypass that for the next two meals. I can. I have another recipe in here for red lentil tomato basil soup. <laughs> Sounds delicious. I've been looking at recipes because I think if I'm going to go on a fast, I want it to be one that is heavenly. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel said, and by the way, it was proven, that after he went on this fast with nothing but uh, vegetables that they gave him and uh, this pulse and, 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 and things like this, that he was much more healthy after that period of time passed than he was when he was eating the king's meat and, and things of this nature. So, you know, the thing is, you know, God has given us the ability, even writes us down recipes if we'll listen for it. That's biblical pulse. The lentil and tomato soup, uh, the lentil soup is, was already in the scripture. I threw in tomatoes because I just thought it would be a good thing to have. It's still a vegetable, right? So, we think about this fasting, but we ought to fast seriously, right? And the only way that you can fast seriously is if you begin to concentrate is, what is it that you're hoping for God to do? Whether it's a corporate fast or whether it's an individual fast here, you need to talk about what it is. And you know, it would be good to have somebody that can come alongside. Have you ever noticed that when you're trying to do something, it's good to have somebody there to encourage you along the way? Yeah. I think that's special. And I want that encouragement. Um, I, and then I got to thinking, you know, I have been so blessed. If I went on this fast, a couple of things would happen. I would be healthier. That would be a good thing because when I was looking at the fast that I've chosen for myself... All the stuff that was in there is what I'm supposed to be doing on a regular basis anyway because of my diabetes and heart disease. And then I'll probably lose weight and look svelte like nobody's business. I didn't know that we could judge between beauty and intelligence and come out the way that I did, 100-100, but I did. I'm totally balanced, but now if I go into this diet, I think I'm even going to be more lovely than I was before. But fasting produces spiritual introspection. When you begin to deny yourself and seek God, you begin to look spiritually inwardly towards yourself. It is a spiritual examination of who I am. I don't know what the next one is, but go there too, because I didn't mark them down here. Keep going. I, I did talk about that. And I did talk about that. And I did talk about that. Now this one. Wow. I didn't even know I did that. I am really getting to be... See what happens next. Wow. Mm -hmm. Notice that it says a private problem requires a private fast. And a group problem requires a group fast. Share the problem. We talked about that. And people must understand the problem. You need to get a good look at the problem. And that's why it's important. Like if it's a personal thing, find somebody that you can trust. Let them come alongside of you to validate you as you go along, and both of you seriously seek the Lord. Now, if that means denying yourself some food, that's okay. You know, and some of us think, I cannot go three days without eating. You don't have to. You could say, you know what? I am not going to have steak for two weeks. I'm going to have pulse. And you better have some close friends after two weeks of pulse. You guys can figure that out later. Fortunately, Larry did right away. But, but, but here's the thing. 
you need to uh, get these people interested in, 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 uh, in seeking God for a solution for your problem, for their problem, for they probably want to share with you as well. On a corporate problem, you know, that's what you enlist the church, the whole church. That's what we did two and a half years ago, and it's been successful. Yeah. Even though we didn't really understand at the time. But it, if you all remember, I called for a fast. And I never told anybody how to fast. I never told you what to do. But I think somebody, some of us really did begin to pray and fast. And then at the end of this two-year period, it looks like that God is going to work a tremendous miracle. You can go to the next one, too, if you like. And you have to fast seriously. Ezra and the returning exiles were not fasting out of ritual. Uh, something that, oh, well, I, in, 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 there is a ritual in the Scripture. The Bible says, when, you know, Jesus said, when you fast. In other words, it is an expectation that we would fast. When you fast, he said. But they weren't doing that. They were fasting for something particular. You know, we've got a lot of people in this church that have a need to have some supernatural intervention. That's right. Amen. Some major strongholds need to be broken. Some major things that they have to go through needs to be, we need to seek God's help with. Yeah. We need him. We need him bad. You know, the thing is, did we ever think to just stop and fast that God would give us the gift of healing? And the gift for prayer for healing. Yeah. Amen. Don't you think we need that now? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. But the thing is, it wasn't that they were going without food. It was that they were agonizing in prayer. Right. They were seeking the Lord. I know that I want a closer walk with God. And even though I may want something from Him, the idea of talking with Him, agonizing Him with prayer, in prayer is the best possible spiritual thing that I can do. Because I'm going to get closer to God. And the closer I get to God, the more power I have, the more power I have to resist the enemy, and also to use the power that God has given me to pray fervently for those people that have a need. It involves spiritual agony. It involves spiritual intercession. But how marvelous is that? I mean, think about it. Somebody stands up in the church and says, I just want to say, God touch me. Yeah. Every single one of us are benefit, beneficiaries yeah. of that testimony. Yeah. Because now we are agonizing with him and intercessing with him. And, and, and the thing is, a fast before attempting a, a solution is, 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 is not, you know, it, you're just not going to make it. We need now, especially... We need God more than we ever have before. As a church, this has been one of the hardest years we've gone through, not financially, but our own people have suffered, suffered, suffered this year. We need to break the yoke. Yes. Amen. And the way that we break the yoke is seeking God in our spiritual life. Peer adventure, that we have more and more people that are praying and, and looking for Jesus. All of a sudden, everything changes in our worship hour. There's power moving. The Bible said, when, when, uh, Judah goes into travail, when the church goes into labor pains, does she have enough power to give birth? We ought to be praying that God would allow us the privilege to be greater witnesses than we've ever been before. But that takes spiritual uh, seeking of the Lord. Yeah. So we got people that are sick in body that need the prayers of healing. We need people, we, we, need, we have people that come here that are lost and they need to be saved. If the church is looking for that power before God, those strongholds, those areas of dimension are, are, uh, 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 dominion are going to be brought down. Yeah. He's going to bring down those strongholds. And we're going to see him move mightily. And so we fast with this idea so that I want to see what God would have me do. I want, and so, so he begins to think, okay, this is what I want to see happen. So it has to be specific, doesn't it? Right. 
This is what I want to see happen. And in order for that to happen, I need to seek the Lord. So he did not fast as he traveled. He did not fast before they all gathered. He did not try to solve the problem before he started fasting. He began to say, okay, you know what? What did they used to call it a long time ago? Somebody talked about uh, a new movement called prayer walking. And uh, it's nothing more than following the Old uh, uh, Testament injunction where God told Abraham to walk through the land. And uh, he was going to give him. He said, just walk through the land. Whatever you see, I'm going to give it to you. Well, that's pretty big right there. What if, per adventure, we started talking with God in such a level that we're on a friendly basis. You know, Abraham was a friend of God. And we got to that part where God says to us, whatever you ask, yeah. I'm going to grant it. Right. Can that be? Is that something possible in the church? Well, the Lord knows we need this. Now, I mean, we've got... I saw today on um, <coughs> Facebook these young girls were in a field of crosses that represented aborted babies. And they have their signs up about Planned Parenthood and they're walking through this field. And they're making fun of everything that's going on. She said, when I say planned, you say par uh, uh, parenthood. And then she started making jokes and poems, and she said, the boarded fetuses in the ground. All of these crosses all around them. Police come. Police couldn't do anything because they put all these crosses up there to represent the aborted children. Don't you think we really do? When you can see Satan at such a level, when you can actually see him in his vileness and I got to tell you something it is a good thing that none of those children were mine for had they been mine they would have not walked out they'd have probably been holding up one of those crosses here you know, they'd been gone and you say hey, preacher you shouldn't do that no well I'd probably they'd probably wish they were gone by the time I'm done with them you say, well, why? I don't know. I don't understand why parents would allow those children to be out there in that place doing such a thing that they did. But it looked like you, you're just not, I guess you're not used to seeing that much evil in one place yeah. as they were doing this. And they, they were making fun of all the people that put all the crosses up there for the ba babies. And they were making poems about it and stepping lightly through the, and said, that one could have been mine. I had an abortion and she was really happy about it. I think that we need more power in the church. We are coming against an enemy that has absolutely unchecked. The Bible said in the latter days that he would be closer to the earth than he's ever been before. The devil I'm talking about. The Bible said he's thrown out, but now he's in the atmosphere, and I believe that he is. And we're seeing him materialize now. Yeah. Evil is becoming worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Uh, and so we need power in the church, yes? Yeah. So... Uh, Ezra implemented old-fashioned prayer walking by bringing the people face to face with their problem. He brought them to the banks of the river and he said, "We, before we go any further, before we go into the wilderness, before we go against the devil, before we go against all the things that are coming against us, he said, we need step-by-step -step guidance. Burdensome problems cannot often be solved with one or two simple steps. Fasting allows the Holy Spirit. And let me just tell you this, and I want you all to get this because it's important. Without the Holy Spirit, the church dies. You hear me talk about the Holy Spirit a lot, but without the Holy Spirit, we die. We don't have the power to overcome anything. We need the Holy Spirit back in the church, and we need it bad. There are mainline denominations that have outlawed the Holy Spirit. You're not supposed to even have it anymore. You know, it's all become just, it is our function. It is our corporate worship. We do this. We don't even want anybody at the altars anymore, none of that stuff. And it doesn't matter what you were. If you're an aardvark now, when you used to be a human being, I guess though, if there was a, a sign that somebody said today that, you know, if, uh, oh, I don't know how it is, but if a, if a man and woman doesn't know if they're a man and a woman, and uh, how can you talk to people that are that stupid 
that they don't even know what sex they are anymore, it's kind of hard to talk to them, isn't it? I mean, how do you tell them? You say, well, today I'm a man. Oh. Because you look like a woman for me. I'm, you know, you have accoutrement that would suggest that you're a woman. And I'm not the brightest lamp, but I'm thinking you can usually tell. Yeah. And this is and, and and then that situation begins to denigrate to the point where he said that no longer is marriage between a man and woman, but it's just on whosoever will. And then another group of people said, Well, since homosexuality is now unnormal, then pedophilia is what I am, and that's a normal too. Yeah. At what point yeah. When the intelligentsia of America has been denigrated to that as a corporate ooze, that's when, the, and I, I think about this, I mean, think about it, folks, not only in abortion, but look at your government today. I mean, we're not trying to solve any of the problems that the United States is trying to, all we're trying to find out is whether or not we can find a way to get rid of Trump. It's, a, it's the whole entire Washington, D.C. How do we get rid of Trump? Not what he's done, not what he's done well. None of those things. But how do we get rid of this man so I want to spend all of our dollars, all of our money on absolutely nothing? Yeah. Nothing. They're not doing anything in Washington. Fighting amongst one another to see which one is going to be able to get another million dollars at the end of their retirement. And there was a time when they thought $165,000 was entirely too much. But now they go, and that $165,000 is a prelude to every one of them leaving with the multi-million dollar contracts. Uh, but this is going on. And in the midst of this is the church of the last days. We need to fast and pray and ask for step-by-step -step guidance. Ezra called a fast to seek God. Just seek God a right way. The Bible tells us that God sovereignly directs our steps and he knew that he was going to go through a minefield of thieves and everybody else. And he said, I need God to direct my steps. Yes. Well, I, I think as a result, the people felt protected now because they had enlisted God. I don't know what tomorrow holds for us, but I'm telling you right now, we need a closer walk with God. So we need to fast and pray. God, what is it that, you know, sometimes it's good to fast and pray and say, Lord, what would you like me to fast about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but Ezra said, I just want to start this one seeking God. That's a pretty good one. I just want to seek God. It's a great way to start, don't you think? You can go to the next one if you want to. But uh, so... Ezra was a spiritual man, and it didn't mean that he was naive or stupid. He understood a human nature. He, every, he understood all of that. But sometimes there are some things that come that we really need to be in a proper position to, 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 to deal with. Change. Does anybody like change? Nobody likes change. I mean, we get, but, you know, there is change causes problems and differences causes problems and circumstances cause problems. You can go to the next one. All of these things, but there are three questions that you need to ask. The next one, the question number one is this. How big is the problem? How big is your problem? Your problem is not bigger than God. So how big is my problem? That's where I start. And that's the next one. Who's involved in the problem? <laughs> Call it out. Sometimes you have to. Even if it's your family, you've got to call out the names. No, so wait a minute. If I'm fasting and I'm seeking God and I call out these names, something harmful might happen to the person. Well, I guess. How big is the problem? Who's involved in the problem? And the next one? What does the larger group think about the problem? Now, this one would be corporate, but for the individuals, let's say that you have somebody that you want to enter into a fast with and you talk with that individual, both of you should think about how big our problem is, who is involved in this problem, and, and, and the thing is, what do I think, the other person think about the problem, what do you think about the problem, all these things are necessary. Next slide, please. So there's three attitudes towards any problem. The one is, I can fuss about it, 
Time infinitum. And then we can preach against sin. And we'll right, keep right on doing that. We can fight or organize the church to resist the sin. We can die, fight sin to the death. Well, sometimes the biggest problems we face are all have its origin, its genesis in sin. Yeah. It comes against us. Uh, so, and next slide, please. The greatest benefit of the Ezra fast is that God gives you eyes to see the problem. So remember we talked about you need to see the problem? Sometimes we don't see it right. But if we begin to fast and ask God, He helps us. He gives us His eyes and we can see the problem before us. You start seeing it through His eyes. And I've got to tell you, that's important. Because if you're going to talk about the problem and you're going to name the problem, all of these things, whether it's corporate or individual, if you're going to do those things, you need the eyes of God to be able to see how the problem really needs to be handled. God's eyes is going to give you the insight that you need to be an overcomer. And we need that. So the next slide, please. So eyes to see the positive. Well, sometimes when you're over, overrun with some of the negative things that are happening, how do you see the positive? Y'all remember the story of David. And uh, he lost his baby. And he said, when he was alive, I fasted, I wept, and I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that this child might live. So, all of a sudden, remember, he's fasting, but he's seeing the positive. He said, maybe God will allow me to see the child live. And I think you need eyes to see the other people involved in what, as well, and the eyes to see the facts, because sometimes the facts get in the way of a, a good aggravation, don't they? Sometimes we find ourselves is the problem. We need the eyes of God. And so when you start that fast and you're asking for God's help, you, and there are, the problem solving that, and that, that he had was, and, and the things that he was looking at, he knew beyond a, a, a shadow of a doubt how big is the problem. So he said, problems often seem much larger than they actually are. Did you ever have a problem and you didn't want to see the next day come because you were so worried about it? And the next day come and it was, oh, well, uh, oh. Yep. I didn't. But the night before, you couldn't even sleep because you, you knew the problem was going to be so huge. And yet something happened. Did you ever think that maybe this God that sometimes we think is very far away was working the night shift? And doing something. So usually, you, you, the thing is, sometimes uh, in an Ezra fast, a problem will shrink before you even realize it if you really start to seek God. And uh, when you're fasting, determine the basic issues involved in the problem. What is the problem? What are the issues involved in the problem? A well-defined problem is a half-solved problem. So you need to define it. Take the time. Say, God, I want you to let me see with your eyes. Let me see. Eyes to see the people. Eyes to see the facts. Eyes, your God. Let me see your eyes. And if I have your eyes, I think that I can deal with this. And, and you, need, you need, during the Ezra fast, you need to ask why this is a problem. Sometimes it's rooted in the motives of other people. Outside the church, it could be if it's a corporate problem. Uh, and sometimes, even when it's an individual problem, the other people involved, and you need God to enter, because you're not going to be able to. Sometimes, if somebody doesn't like you, and you're trying to fix that, and you can't even go to them, you need somebody to be your ambassador. And God can be your ambassador. God can get there. He can take care of things. Sometimes you need to consult people individually to gather data about the problem, and that's okay too. But there are, go, go on to the next uh, slide. Uh, the best solution and the next uh, agreement. The majority of the body agrees that God is leading to a certain solution. Now, this is both corporate and individual. When the two of you are praying or three of you, whatever's in your group, or the whole church, 
and you are praying for a solution. Maybe somebody will present that solution. You need to ask God to allow you to see that through his eyes. And then if you see that solution, and it seems to be that's the way that God is moving, the resolution, well, the solution solves the problems and resolves tensions, and you see all of this, and, and you need that. You need to be able to see the positive. By the way, you know how you get blind eyes? Emotional eyes can get blinded with tears, and fearful eyes are blinded with terror. And sometimes it is a very frightening thing that we're dealing with. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. And you've been there. I think some, many of you have. That's the time to say, God, I am fasting now because of these things. Sometimes I cannot see it correctly through my own tears. And God, I can't see it through my own fears. Because I don't know what to do. God, I don't know what to do. What is wrong with that? I think that's a great prayer. God, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to fast, and I'm going to agonize, I'm going to seek you, I'm going to pray, I'm going to say, God, send down your knowledge, because I don't know what to do. Well, that sounds like a simple solution. It's a grand solution. If God is God, then say, Lord, these are my eyes, I want yours. This is my heart, I need yours. Lord, I need your help here. I... I'm looking through emotional eyes and I'm blinded by the tears because of this problem and I'm terrified because I don't know how to get through it and God, I need you. I need you. You see, the Ezra fast produces a new vision of what God can do. Blinded eyes surrender the values. But an Ezra fast gets you focused again upon the word of God. Listen, if the Word of God is true, you know every one of us are living far below what we could. If God has put all these promises out there and we've not seen Him working in our life, well, problems grow when we lose perspective. And right now, the devil is spending all of his time to disprove the Word of God. You see, because there's power in the Word. So mainline denominations say, it's not the Word of God, it's just a book of a culture from long ago. If it's a book of a culture long ago, then it is no longer relevant to us. If it's not relevant to us, we have nothing. We are absolutely empty. There is nothing. We have nothing. That is the only authority that there is. And without the Word of God, we have nothing to stand upon. But if the Word of God is true, and I believe with all of my heart that it is true then we live far below what we could because those promises are there for every one of us. So we see this, the the fast gets your eyes focused again upon this God that is able to do great, marvelous, wonderful things if we'll allow Him. Eyes to see other people along the way and focus not only on the problem but also on those that are fasting with you. I, I want to see the church and if I'm in a I know that I'm working on some things in my own life. And I am going to try my very best during this time to see others that are involved and try to come alongside them as well. Eyes to see the facts. Step-by-step problem solving. You see, not only is it, it glorifies God when, when we see what God can do. We grow. Yeah. We grow Because spiritually we are strengthened because we have seen the work of God. You can go to the next one too. But if you're going to have some problems, is there no more? Did I at the end? I did, okay. So we get the facts. We establish the biblical principles. Can God do it? How big is God? How big is your problem? Determine the solutions. Choose a solution. I think sometimes getting the facts, uh, you know, you make your best decisions on good information, don't you? (laughs) That doesn't seem like it's profound, but it does. Uh, You make bad decisions on bad information, you know, and and, and without any information, you make lucky decisions, right? (laughs) So if you got good decisions, usually because you got good information, bad decisions because you got bad information, but uh, without any information, you just better hope you're lucky. 
But the next thing is to look at those principles carefully. Evaluate the facts and consider the, consider the principles. Find the problem, define the problem. We don't, we don't, you know, the thing is, if we want to see what God can do, we need to be brave enough to define it. A definition for that problem is a marvelous thing. Whatever you want, whether it's a corporate thing or whether it's individual, whatever it is I want, then I need to define it before God. And then maybe as God is speaking with us and we are fasting and we're getting closer, we may have to refine the problem. We refine the problem because God allows us to see through his eyes and some of the stuff that we were dealing with may not be stuff that we need to deal with. Right. So, so we redefine the problem. And uh, I, I think on rare occasions, um, it, 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 150 years ago, the Independent Presbyterian Church of Savannah, Georgia was contemplating building a new sanctuary. And the building was set toward the rear of the property, resulting in a large front yard. And everyone voted unanimously for the project except one lady who withheld her, with, withheld her vote. It is said that she prayed. We don't know if she fasted, but we know that she prayed. And uh, then went to the chairman and, and shared her idea. She suggested building a new sanctuary toward the front of the property to allow room for a garden between the sanctuary and the educational building to, to the rear. The garden could be used for weddings and beautiful camellias and so on and so forth, and it would just be prettier. And after everybody considered for a time being, they, they thought, well, you know what? Her plan is better than the other plans we've had. Because not only is she beautifying the church, she's using all the property, she's losing all the space. And she prayed about it. We don't know if she fasted, she prayed about it. And then she went to them, and sometimes... You have to be brave enough to say, you know what? This is what God has revealed to me. I'm done? Oh. How do you get done right on time? I don't understand that. So, here's the, the aim, and I'll quit. Solving a problem through the Ezra fast. I will examine all the facts to understand the problem. We ask God to give me insight into its cause and its solution. And after I followed all the principles that God has shown me in his word and have done everything I can do to solve the problem, I will accept the results by the providence of God. Wow, that's, that's kind of heavy duty. So the foods that I'm going to have, and I, and I, got to, I didn't get into that. I wanted to talk to you about that. But you choose on the fast, the foods of which you're going to abstain from. Maybe, yes? So you're saying you can still eat that. Yes, you can. It's not so much, it is more in the agonizing of the prayer. Let's say, but no, you do have to fast. What the body does, when it gets hungry, it reminds you that you're doing something. It reminds you of, I am in a fast because, okay? So, let's say that um, there's two of you and you are fasting for something uh, that you're trying to deal with and that person's trying to deal with, you know, whatever that is. I, I'm not going to give examples of that, but let's just say that, or maybe three or four of you are, are together and you're fasting about something you want to see in your life, her life, his life, whatever, whoever's in your group. You've identified the group, you've identified the problem, you've talked about the problem, all of you know the problem, and now you're going to enter into a fast. So then, let's say that Marilyn is one of the people that's in your fast. So you say to Marilyn, Marilyn, tomorrow you fast your breakfast. And during that breakfast time, you pray about this problem that God will give us insight. And I won't have lunch. Okay? That's you. You won't have lunch because you're going to pray just as fervently for her and that problem or whoever's in that group. Okay? And then the other person, you say to them, you won't be having dinner because you're going to be praying for that something. So you've got this group that has been praying around the clock, really, basically, for, for whatever that need is. And then it is not so much that she missed her breakfast, you missed your lunch, and they missed their dinner. It is during that time, prayer, agonizing prayer, was offered about that particular problem. Okay? That's where the, the key is. Now, but I miss my lunch. Yes, but during that time that you were hungry, 
you were saying, I know why I'm hungry. Because I'm praying and agonizing to God about this problem. So, Lord, keep me hungry until such time as this problem. You know, now the thing is, some person may say, I want to go on a fast for three days and I'm not going to have any food whatsoever during that three days. That's up to them. They should drink water and they should not be foolish. So they should stop and analyze the fast. Like, for instance, if you're a diabetic and you decide not to eat food for three days, you're leaving this world, so you can ask God direct, probably within the day and a half. You know, you, you see, you can just, you can, you'll be up there. You can say, yeah, I kind of blew it then. So, you know, so maybe one person says, okay, I'm going to eat no, uh, David said, I'm not going to let any pleasant foods come, I think it was David, no pleasant foods come, and I'm not going to have steak and baked potato, I'm going to have pulse and asparagus heads. Uh, that's all I'm going to have. But I'm going to eat that, but I'm going to not have any pleasant foods because of the fact that I want to concentrate on this prayer, okay? Somebody else may say, okay, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm just going to fast every breakfast for the next week or every lunch for the next week. Or I'm not going to have any meat. I'm just going to have vegetables and fruit. I'm going to have vegetables. I have the fruit in the morning because vegetables for breakfast don't sound good. How many eat vegetables for breakfast? Oh, I'm not talking about an omelet. <laughs> you guys have like cabbage? A little fried cabbage in the morning, yes? Well, you know what? In Europe, though, salads are the big thing for breakfast. When we were there, we were in Israel. Every day they had this big smorgasbord of 7,000 salad items and three boiled eggs. And whoever got to the boiled eggs first had a normal breakfast. But... But, but, you know, it may be that somebody says, okay, this week uh, for breakfast, I'm having fruit. And I'm going to have vegetables for lunch and dinner. But I'll have nothing else. And I'll drink, wa I'll drink you know, water. Some other person said, I'm not having any food, but I'm going to drink all kinds of juices. Okay? But be careful. Understand your body. You know, and what you can do. Because you don't want to get to the situation where you passed out, you're not praying. You know what I mean? So, agonizing, yes. You should agonize over the prayer and agonize seriously. And it may be that you miss that meal, but that time that you had with God was so good that you, instead of quitting, you decide, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to pray until I'm hungry again. Who knows? Fasting is not supposed to be just, I'm not going to eat anything. It is more than that. It is seeking God. And if that causes some agony in your body, that's a good thing, because it reminds you of what you're doing. So yeah, a little hunger is a good thing. But you don't have to go crazy, is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Now, I feel that if you're fasting and you sit down, this is my, my, my uh, our feelings about it. If you're uh, fasting, and, uh, you know, you should wash your face, comb your hair, and go to the table. There is nothing on your plate, but you sit there and you converse with everybody that's there, and you treat that as it's just a meal, okay, even though you're not eating. Now, I don't think that you should broadcast your fast to everybody along the way, but I think there are some key components. If I fast, I must tell Jill not to fix my dinner because I don't want her to waste it. That's foolishness. But if I come to the, to the table, if I come to the table and I'm not eating, she immediately knows because I eat. You don't get a body like this, you know, without eating. But so, so you should treat it as if it should not be what other people say. Oh, look at me. I'm fasting. You know, because then you become like the Pharisees and Sadducees. You know, so you wash your face, you comb your hair, you go and sit down there, and uh, you, you, you know, you, even though you're not eating, you let everybody know that this is not a struggle for you, that you're glad that you're fasting. You know? So, and, and that's important that they understand that it is, it's not somebody who says, Oh, Pastor made me go on a fast, and I'm just starving to death. You know, you, you don't do that. So, uh, any other questions before we. We, we stop with the Ezra fast. 
Did you learn anything? Yes. That'd be better, I guess, did you? I hope, hope you got something out of it. Amen. Uh, that's a lot of material to try to cover in the night, but, um, and I didn't, had good intentions. But uh, does anybody have any questions before we break? Anything you want to ask about? I hope that some of you will think about um, a fast. It may be something in your personal life, some area of weakness that you see, some area of pain that you see, some health issue that you see for somebody else, and the list goes on and on and on. Open up your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and see what God will do with you. Amen. Okay? Yes? It was a fun time, I thought. Yeah. How many would like to go on a TV fast? Yeah, go on one of those. Listen, you'll be so much smarter at the end of the week. And if you stay away from the news, you'll be happy. Because I'm telling you right now, every time I look at the news, I'm looking for duct tape put around my head so it don't explode. Um, I did put some uh, recipes, basic pulse up here, uh, biblical pulse, if you, if you wanted it. And if you would like to take one home with you, this pulse, uh, and try it at your house, uh, you can pick up that recipe. And there's 10 of them here. If that's not enough, we'll make you some more. I, I, don't, I didn't make up any for the uh, lentil and tomato soup. I didn't know if anybody would like that besides me. But I do have it here. If you'd like a copy, we could make some before we leave. Um, here it is. This is Biblical Pulse. And, and this one sounds delicious. Seven ounces of red lentils. Wash thoroughly so the grint is removed. One and a half pints of stock. You could use whatever stock. You could use a vegetable stock. You could use a chicken stock. You could use a beef stock. But I don't know that you'd want like a steak stock or beef stock. But, and then you have a, a can of tomatoes and salt and pepper, coriander, uh, a little cilantro, uh, tarragon leaves, either one, you know, whatever you have there. And uh, then you gather the ingredients and put them all together and cook for 10 minutes, cover the pan, lower the heat, simmer for another 15 minutes, and have this delicious, delicious red lentil tomato soup as your meal. It's part of the Daniel fast. You could have that if you want. You don't have to have it. But if you want a copy of it, I've got two here. and we can make. There's the uh, pulses over there, and we can make copies of them if you want them. Uh, and then before you leave tonight, put your dollar up here. I think what we may do, if you guys want to, I was thinking about sending uh, this money to feed the poor in Haiti. It's up to you. I, I, if, if, if any of you don't want to be sending your money out of state or town, no, country, <laughs> country, let us know. Uh, I was listening to some program today, and they were talking about that uh, it is pretty pretty bad there uh, still and uh, hoping to feed the feed the kids and we have somebody on ground in that area so <laughs> we did that we we sent a thousand dollars to that family um, but I'd like to point out you guys have done and, and I've got a list of that too of what the Wednesday night people have done and it is the largest um, missionary arm of our church right here on Wednesday night. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. So you put your dollar up here. And it, all the money that you give, by the way, 100% of it goes to charity. So God bless you all. Hope you enjoyed tonight's lesson. Amen. And come back when you can. Yeah. I better make some copies of this just in case somebody wants it. That's the delicious pulse right there.